अखंड मंडलाकार व्याप्त ये न चराचर तत्पदम दर्शित ये न तस्म श्री गुरवे नमः टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू डिस्कस अबाउट इंडियन साइकोलॉजी फ्रॉम द आयुर्वेदिक पर्सपेक्टिव एंड एट द वेरी आउटसेट आई एड लाइक टू पॉइंट आउट that it looks like we have to clear many misconceptions before we enter into the topic first and foremost there are even misconceptions about what ayurveda is ayurveda is sometimes referred to as hindu medicine or you know the indigenous system medicine uh, that is indigenous to india traditional medicine so ayurveda is also sometimes equated with vegetarianism herbal medicine so i think it would be worth spending a few moments exploring what ayurveda is from the traditional classical perspective and then move on to our topic you know the word ayurveda is itself a compound word it's made up of two words called ayus and veda and normally we translate ayurveda as science of life or knowledge of life personally i don't prefer to use the word science when we uh, refer to ayurveda because the word veda i mean cannot be actually equated with science i mean science is a loaded word and now especially in modern times it has come to be associated with a specific very limited way of building knowledge so it is even better to look uh, consider veda as knowledge system and so generally we can say that ayurveda is the knowledge of life but if you want to give it a more modern kind of uh, terminology ayurveda really translates as life science so we cannot equate ayurveda with medicine you know it's it's very similar to biology bios means life logos means to study and then if you look at ayurveda it's almost more equivalent to biology rather than medicine and for this reason there are also some modern thinkers Uh, modern allopathic physicians who have lately got interested in ayurveda and they are also beginning to talk about ayurvedic biology now it's interesting to note what these two words two small words ayur and veda inform us about what ayurveda deals with you know the word ayus means in sanskrit it's coming from a root inagata means that which goes that which disappears so the first and foremost thing that ayurveda informs us is that we are dealing with life which is limited you know life span is limited the word in gada has other meanings also gati means to move means life is not static it is constantly moving it is moving towards its own death and that is the paradox of life and this movement is extremely dynamic so the life is continuously adapting itself to survive because it is moving towards in that inevitable death and so the entire focus of the life process is 
self preservation and that is the third meaning of the word ayus self preservation means that life is constantly adapting to survive and this survival happens at three levels you know at the cellular level every cell every moment the biological units of life called as cell which was called in ayurveda as jiva paramanu at the cellular level we see this instinct for survival and then at the organism level there is biological reproduction and then you know at a spiritual level there is transmigration or movement from one life to the other so this is what the word ayus denotes so it is actually not fair to translate ayus as life because the word life doesn't give you these insights when you look at the sanskrit word ayus you understand that ayurveda is trying to give you insight about the life process and that very word ayus describes the life process this is the beauty of sanskrit that you don't need definitions words are themselves definitions so the word ayus evokes in our mind the idea that life is limited so ayurveda does not give you a false promise of you know everlasting life it's very practical and down to earth and so when we say ayurveda it already means it comes with a warning that you know your life is limited come on make use of it make it as productive as possible this is the message now this is the beauty also of sanskrit like if you learn the word ayurveda and get an insight into what it means whenever you hear the word ayus you are reminded of your limited lifespan now this doesn't happen when you learn ayurveda as life science now you this kind of transformational power that sanskrit words have this is what i wanted to point out before we get into the heart of our discussion and also that the secret of deferring delaying death you can only delay death and how long you delay the inevitable how long you live depends on how well you adapt so that's the next meaning of ayus so death is inevitable but if you adapt you can prolong life and in the process that prolongation is by self reconstruction because you are dying moment by moment and reconstructing yourself this is the process of life every day every moment you know every year we are born again and again and that rebirth is the gati the third meaning of the word ayus and this happens at the cellular level whenever we eat food we are being born again with the elements of nature so that is why eating food was considered as a big yatna in our tradition in ayurveda especially it is a yatna which we perform every day to make I mean uh, regenerate ourselves the second thing is the organismic rebirth and the third thing is that life continues from one birth to the other so this is what ayus is and ayurveda is the knowledge which gives us a deep insight into the life process so quality of life productivity of life living life to its fullness that is the focus of ayurveda and not just treating and healing a few diseases now if you look at the word veda we translate veda as knowledge i already hinted that science is not a good translation for veda and i will try to explain why because the word veda actually comes from the sanskrit root vid vid means jnane to know but we are not aware that this vid has at least four you know dimensions to it one is satta sattayam vidyade that which exists so veda is dealing with what is existent it's dealing with what is real what can be brought into the domain of our experience it's not imaginary that's what the word veda means sattayam if veda says something it means it really exists it's something which you can bring into the purview of your experience and not only that sattayam vidyade veti jnane means you can conceptualize that so veda deals with the universe cell experiences that we have which can be conceptualized by the human mind means uh, you can 
have a concept about what you are experiencing. And you can analyze it. And this conceptualization is what we call you observe what is existent and then you have data, you transform it into information, knowledge. So that process is what is indicated by these two meanings of the word Veda. And the third thing is that Veda also means to analyze. Vinte vicharane. These concepts can be analyzed. It's not something to be believed in. You know, it's something to be observed and experienced. And when you analyze this concept, you get the prapti. Vindade vindadi praptav means you obtain and you actualize that experience of what you are talking about. So, from observation to experience through conceptualization and analysis. Now, this is the knowledge cycle. And so, Veda is representing a process, it's not a word. And this is why, so Ayurveda is made up of two powerful words, which also are definitions. So, Ayurveda gives us a very deep insight into what is the life process and how we can obtain reliable knowledge about this life process. So, this is, you know, what Ayurveda, how Ayurveda is defined by the tradition itself. So, we can say that Ayurveda is that knowledge which is acquired by observation, conceptualization, analysis and verification and again and again and which gives you a deep insight into what life is, how life can adapt to that inevitable, you know, ultimate consequence of death and how it can regenerate itself and how life can continue. So, this is the framework from which Ayurveda operates. So, with this understanding, we can try to explore today what is the Ayurvedic perspective on psychology. And since we started with a few questions, is Ayurveda vegetarianism, is Ayurveda herbalism, is Ayurveda, you know, Hindu medicine, I would like to point out that these are misconceptions. In fact, it turns out that we are going to deal with a lot of misconceptions today because there is no such thing as psychology in the Indian tradition. And we are talking about Indian psychology from an Ayurvedic perspective. Similarly, if you look at Ayurveda as Hindu medicine, I mean Ayurveda has not, uh, you know, subscribed to any particular religion. Ayurveda has accepted, you know, religious elements, Ayurveda has considered it as extremely helpful and extremely needed for the human being. Because Ayurveda says that, you know, religion is also an experience that the human being has to go through. To that extent, Ayurveda accepts religion, but it doesn't subscribe to any particular religion. Even any particular scientific thought, because in the Charaka Samhita it is mentioned very clearly, that vividhani hi shastrani bhishajam pracharanti loge. So there is a dilemma of medical pluralism in the time of Charaka. Charaka is telling that there are so many systems of medical science in the world, which one to choose? How will we choose? And being Hindu is definitely not a criteria mentioned by Charaka. In the narrow sense of the word, that's what I mean. Because Ayurveda is all about finding truth. There are 18 criteria mentioned to call something a Shastra. And those 18 criteria are very objective criteria. And this is how Ayurveda defines it. So, so it's not fair to call Ayurveda as, you know, a religious system. And if you look at herbalism, Ayurveda is not just about herbs. Ayurveda is a medical system which said that anything under the sun is medicine. Nahi kinjit anaushadam jagati means there is nothing which is not of medicinal value in the whole universe. There is a story of Jivaka who was a disciple of a great uh, medical doctor of those days, Atreya. And at the end of the studies, the students were given a test. They had to move around and come back with you know, natural resources, especially medicine, plants, which did not have any medicinal value. So, it turns out that Jivaka took a long time to come back, whereas 
all his other, you know, classmates came back very quickly and came up with one plan or the other. And when Jivaka came back empty-handed, his teacher asked him, Oh Jivaka, what happened? Did you not find any plant that does not have medicinal value? And Jivaka with a very worried look said, Teacher, uh, I couldn't find a plant that had no medicinal value. And then Atreya said that you are the only one who passed this test. Now you are a doctor. So, we, in Ayurveda we have used everything, even from ex excreta, to, you know, plants, to animal products, to minerals, everything has been explored as a source of medicine. So it's wrong to consider Ayurveda as herbal medicine. And if you look at vegetarianism, and Ayurveda is not synonymous again with vegetarianism. Ayurveda, I'm not saying that Ayurveda promotes non-vegetarianism, but Ayurveda takes a balanced outlook. And whatever is necessary for the support of life in that particular context, it, uh, you know, advocates that. So, we can say that Ayurveda is a knowledge system that tries to give us the deepest insight about life. In fact, we can say that Ayurveda is a process of life discovering itself. So, Ayurveda is not something which should be learned only by medical doctors. And this is a very important message because traditionally, every living human being had to learn Ayurveda to improve his or her own quality of life. You know, Ayurveda is like a mirror. It, when you look at I, the mirror, you see yourself. So Ayurveda tells you what is your uniqueness in this universe. You are, you are, you are, I mean, your whole existence is a fingerprint. Your signature is what expresses through your life. And knowing that is the foundation for leading and developing a healthy existence in this universe. And this is the beginning. So every life form, so the Ayurvedic texts say, who should learn Ayurveda? Anybody who is desirous of attaining healthy, you know, high quality life should learn Ayurveda. So now let us look at psychology. So, if you talk about psychology, we have, we have the topic Indian psychology. Now that also needs some explanation. It's something called Indian psychology? I don't know. Uh, because we are talking about universals. So it's not that when we talk about Indian psychology, are we talking about Indian mind which is different from the rest of the world? That cannot be because according to Ayurveda, these are universal principles. You know, the self, the mind is universal. It's the same with, of course, adaptations to the time and place where we live. Uh, it doesn't really make sense to talk about Indian psychology in that sense. That's one problem. The other challenge is the word psychology itself. There is no word in Sanskrit that is equivalent to the word psychology, because psychology means study of the mind, the psyche. And there is no word also even equivalent to the word psyche in Ayurveda, because here we have very clear terminologies that different, differentiate the higher faculties of the human mind, like the self, the intellect, the ahankara or the ego, and uh, it's very difficult to find exact equivalence for all of them. So we will go through a process of deconstructing these words and then trying to put them in context and get an insight. But at the very outset, I would like to point out that in the Indian tradition, the focus has always been the source of the mind or consciousness. So what we have, at best we can say, is the knowledge of consciousness or the signs of consciousness, which is distinctly, you know, absent in the Western tradition of psychology. And that's one difficulty. So, if you really ask what is the Ayurvedic perspective of Indian psychology, I would say that the Ayurvedic perspective is there is nothing called Indian psychology and there is no psychology at all in our tradition. Now, if you look at the mind, now then, if 
if you ask the question, is there really a mind? Yes. You know, Ayurveda does talk about the body and mind as one continuum. There is a very beautiful metaphor in our classical texts which compares the body and mind as, you know, the vessel and the ghee in, into, I mean, ghee which is poured into the vessel. So, imagine you have an iron vessel and then you pour ghee into the vessel. If, the, if you pour heated ghee into the vessel, the vessel gets heated. Or, if you pour, you know, cold ghee into a heated vessel, then also, the ghee also gets heated. Now, this, is the, this was one of the ways in which they tried to show that the body and mind make one com continuum. When we talk about the body and mind, it's almost we are looking at things that are same. It's just one thing, but still appear different. And they have not really drawn clear conclusions on where they are different, because we are dealing with one continuum. It's like heat and cold. Heat and cold is one continuum. You cannot say at this point, this is hot, this is cold. It's very relative. At any point, you know, it's colder or hotter than some other point in that continuum. So when we look at the body and mind, we are dealing with a continuum that keeps influencing every other point on that continuum. This is what is interesting when we look at mind and body in the Ayurvedic uh, perspective. We are not looking at two distinct entities. This is what I want to highlight. You know, it's like we are dealing with a continuum. And on that continuum, on every point, you know, you can see that it is influenced by the rest of that continuum. And on one side we say, now this is body, and as we go to the other side we say, it is more of mind now. But the fact is that it's always body and mind together. So this is the viewpoint with which Ayurveda looks at the human body. So the real uh, distinction is always between what is self and non-self. Not between what is body and mind. I mean, that was never a problem in the tradition of Ayurveda. We never had to worry about, is the body different from the mind or the mind is... You know, this was been the biggest preoccupation in the West. In the Cartesian tradition, we have the split between the body and the mind, which created this dichotomy, this modern thinking of you know, separating the mind from the body and ultimately reducing the mind as an epiphenomenon of the body. I mean, that is the dominant worldview. We have a mind because the, there is some chemistry in the brain. And if there is no chemistry in the mind, there is no mind. But in the Ayurvedic tradition, we felt the body and mind are one. And the whole distinction is mind versus the self. And that is the reason why in our tradition, we did not have psychology. Rather, we had the knowledge dealing with the self. So, we say that the body is actually only expressing your mind. So this is today we call as body language, we call this as constitution. It's every physical expression of yours is rooted in the mind. And this viewpoint actually helped or led Ayurveda to come with a very fundamental conclusion in the context of healing that all diseases actually originate in the mind. And that ultimate healing means healing at the level of the mind. Because when you heal the mind, the body also is healed. You can influence, so they worked around the relationship between the mind-body continuum. Where should we actually work? Should we work on the body to control the mind? Or should we work on the mind to control the body? Or should we work on both? And the ultimate conclusion was that, in the ultimate analysis, it is the mind that actually matters. If you work at the level of the mind, then everything else falls in place. And we will elaborate this further as we move forward. So, who is the physician, you know, the most eminent physician, the physician par excellence in Ayurveda, is not therefore one who treats physical illnesses. So you can claim to be a physician only if you can enter into the mind of your patient. Now, this is something which really makes Ayurveda different from the current medical paradigm, where you don't even have to look at the patient to treat. 
you only look at images, blood test results, you have hardly time to even have eye to eye contact with the patient that you are treating. But in Ayurveda, we say that unless you enter into the inner core of your patient, you cannot initiate the process of healing. Because a physician in Ayurveda is one who facilitates healing. And that facilitation of healing comes from the mind. And in this context, I want to refer to some very interesting research that is happening in modern medicine on what is called as a placebo. You know, placebo is uh, fake medicine. And uh, we use that to test whether the effects of medicines are real. That one group we will give the trial drug, the other group we give the placebo. And actually for the trial drug to be accepted, it should have an effect which is more than what a placebo gives. Now this is, the placebo effect has been used in a very negative way in modern science. But you know, what the placebo informs us is that there is tremendous healing potential in the human mind. So even uh, when you do drug research, you are actually afraid of the placebo because the placebo works most of the time. There was a very interesting talk by an eminent scientist in which he said, he made this categorical statement that the placebo is the best medicine. It's the most proven medicine of humanity because there is no other medicine that has been tested so many times. The placebo is there in almost every clinical trial that you conduct. And the most shocking finding is that majority of the time the placebo has been found to be more effective than the trial medicine. So this means that the human mind works in healing most of the time. That's the point I wanted to make. The placebo is so effective that it works most of the times. Even when you spend billions of dollars, do all your preclinical research, find that magic molecule which seems to be working on rats and you know on cell lines, and then you come to the humans and our poor placebo without any such backup steals the show. It just works and your, and your drug fails. Billions of dollars goes down the drain just because of placebo. And that placebo is actually the healing power in your mind. Modern medicine today ignores the placebo effect. It is trying to eliminate the placebo effect in healing. And Ayurveda says that you have to amplify the placebo effect and that is healing. You know, if you can treat a person by just activating his mind, why do you need medicine? And now it makes a lot of sense to say why Ayurveda considered the mind as the seed of disease. And the true physician has one who awakens the mind. So, learning, I mean, coming to treat your disease with Ayurveda is like trying to wake up. The Ayurvedic physician says to your mind, come on, wake up. And then you can be healed. And medicines are only, you know, a top up. It's just the icing on the cake. Today, we do the other way around. We give all the medicines and at the end, when you are on a deathbed, we give mental support. And now the mind cannot wake up anymore. You know, in cancer, you give the most dangerous chemicals and uh, radiation and then your whole life force is destroyed. And then you are allowed to do all the other things. You know, so this is a big contrast. So Ayurveda comes with the message that if you understand, so now what you may be wondering that we said there is no mind or psychology in Ayurveda and looking at what we discussed so far, Ayurveda seems to be all about mind and psychology. Now that is a paradox and we'll try to solve this as we move forward. What is the final take, how Ayurveda looks at it. But this is the most profound message that Ayurveda gives today, that we have been not tapping that tremendous potential of healing that is with us in our own minds. And if we rely more on that, then the amount of medications that we have to use, the amount of high-tech interventions that we have to keep us alive can be drastically reduced. So we can say that the mind is just the subtle aspect of this continuum and the body is the grosser aspect. The body can influence the mind but if you learn to influence the body through the mind, then you are in the driver's seat. With, like the other way around, 
the mind goes out of your control after some time. If you try to control the mind with your body, it's like using these drugs and other things. We, we fall into that trap. Now, drug addiction is also one of the ways if, you know, in which we wrongly understand how to deal with this mind-body continuum that we have. It's like a seesaw. And this is one of our fundamental uh, challenges. We are not able to deal with this mind-body continuum in which we are trapped. Our consciousness is trapped in this mind-body continuum. And that's what we call as life. Life is a process through which consciousness gets trapped in this body-mind continuum. And we face this existential crisis. Our mind is going in one direction, our body is moving in another direction, yet they belong to the same continuum. Where is the point of control? And we mistake it. The body is the point of control. And modern science has made this fundamental mistake again. The focus has been on the body. Through the body, we are trying to control the mind. And this is medicine. So if you have a mental illness, we don't treat. We only manage. We just bang the mind with tranquilizers or stimulants. You know, that's, what, that's the best we can do through the body. You can hit the mind. You can, you know, uh, tranquilize the mind. But you cannot awaken your mind. Nobody has ever taken modern psychiatric drugs and become enlightened or awakened. You know, they go to sleep forever. You look at their face, you know they are taking a, uh, you know, a medicine for your mind. But on the other hand, if you make the mind the point of control, then your body awakens. Or both the mind and body goes to sleep. And drug addiction is just another form of this dilemma and a wrong decision made on how to take control of your mind. And so, this is what Ayurveda tells is that as human beings, when you learn Ayurveda for your own life, this is the first message that comes from this tradition, that you have to take control of your mind. And that is the step to healing, to health and higher experiences in your life. Now let's look at what is mind. Mind is very elusive because you know you cannot see it. You, we, get, we can only infer its existence. So even Ayurveda has asked this question, is there really a mind? And it's very difficult to study the mind because the mind is like an interface between the body and the self. So you cannot study it without referring to the body or to the self. So it's not that it is not existent, but you cannot separate the mind. You cannot take the mind out of a person, put it in the microscope and see what's going on. Like you take a cell, you know, because in the cell also you see the shadow of the mind. Whatever you take from the body, you see the shadow of the mind because it is part of the same continuum. You cannot separate it. So if you pull any part of your body, the mind also comes along. And so most of the time when you study the mind, you are actually studying the body. And that is why in modern science they say, the mind is only an epiphenomenon of the body. But that's not true. It's because it's one continuum that you mistake it to be a product of your mind. But it is not. And on the other side, if you focus more on your mind, then you can see what is beyond the mind, it's consciousness. And once the mind hooks to the consciousness, then you have another experience. And in the Indian tradition, in the Ayurvedic tradition, this is the big difference in strategy. Today we try to study the mind through the body. So all techniques, you fit an electroencephalogram, see what's happening in your brain, or you do all these kind of, you know, other physiological parameters, tests, to see what's going on inside the mind. But in the ancient system, they made a very critical decision. They said that through the body, we can see only the shadow of the mind. If you want to capture the mind, hook the mind to yourself. And then only you can study the mind. And that is why, instead of psychology, it became the study of consciousness. Study of consciousness means the study of the mind hooked to your consciousness. And the, what is there in Ayurveda about the mind is all about the insights gained through this approach. Not by looking at the mind from the body, but by looking at the mind through the 
perspective of your own consciousness. So today when we study mind, we are studying only behavior. We are only studying the shadow of the mind. This is the problem. So what we would say is that all modern psychology is also actually not psychology. It is only a shadow of psychology because you are not confronting the real mind which is at a deeper level. So now this is like deconstructing that whole world psychology also from a modern viewpoint and also from the classical Ayurvedic viewpoint. Such a thing as psychology, even modern psychology doesn't exist because they don't really study the mind. So Ayurveda has derived its understanding of the mind from, you know, the Vedas and the Upanishadic system of thought, also the Nastika Darshanas, because Ayurveda has been a very accommodative, pragmatic science. It's only concerned about survival of life, about, you know, the expression of life. So whatever is useful is accepted. It's eclectic in, one's, in that sense. You know, it has borrowed and taken concepts that are useful and practical, and it has shown. So in Ayurveda, we talk about you know, it is all about connecting things and this connection is called Sutra. Sutra is like a thread. So knowledge, according to Ayurveda, is threading concepts together so that they make a coherent system of thought which can help us to practically deal with our problems. So you can even find reflections of Buddhistic thought in, in Ayurveda. And this is why I say we cannot, uh, you know, reduce it to some particular religious thinking or so here we have viewpoints right from Nyaya Darshana to Vedanta in Ayurveda. In different contexts they have explained the mind from different viewpoints according to the context and utility. Yes, so in Ayurveda we have actually a very multi-dimensional understanding of the mind. And it's really interesting that Ayurveda has drawn upon the viewpoints of the darshanas or the vedas as i was mentioning earlier even from buddhism and other schools of thought that were traditionally not within the vedic system the reason is that ayurveda wants to give a very experiential platform because ayurveda is talking about evolution of life and so ayurveda reaches out to life in all its levels of existence so this makes it very interesting and easy for us to relate to what Ayurveda is talking about. Because at each level of experience, you can connect with Ayurveda. So you have the Nyaya view. Nyaya means the starting point of your journey. Nyaya means coming from the word Niyate, to lead. So Nyaya Darshana is what initiates you into the path of knowledge. So as a novice, you have a certain view of the world. And the darshan actually relates, helps you to relate to that experience. It, it, it reassures you that what you are experiencing is what we are also talking about. And then how you can go to a higher level of experience. So we go from Nyaya to Vaisheshika. Vaisheshika means a world of differences. The world of multiplicity. And this is our first experience. When we start exploring the world, we see the world of differences. Everything is distinct from one another. And we are overwhelmed by this variety of existence. And we begin to see what is it that is common behind. Is th are there finite entities from which this infinite variety manifests? And that takes you to Sankhya. Sankhya means that which can be counted. So Vaisheshika is that which cannot be counted. Because the, the items in the universe are infinite. You cannot count all of them. How can you count them? when we focus on principles. So the Sankhya system now tells you that this infinite universe can be reduced to a handful of principles. So that's a great discovery. Now you know this is also part of your evolution of understanding. So Ayurveda helps your mind to evolve to these levels of experiencing the universe. And then you, Sankhya ends in a dichotomy. It says that ultimately we come to this point of the self and the not self. This is what the universe is all about. This is what your existential problem is all about. This whole inf infinite universe, the principles, it ultimately leads to that inner conflict that you have. Except when you are in deep sleep, there is a fear at the root of your mind. The fear of the non-self. And this is the source of our anxiety. And the healing happens 
when this fear is eliminated. When you know that there is only one self, there is no, the non-self is non-existent. This is according to Ayurveda, the ultimate healing. And this is called as Abhaya, means no fear. No fear because there is no non-self. And some of the best medicines in Ayurveda are also called as Abhaya. That same word is used to give this deep understanding. So what Ayurveda does is through the darshanas, it is taking you through a journey of mental transformation. Taking to you to the point where you can see the distinct you know, world of the self and the non-self. And then it tells you to take that dive, plunge into the world of your own consciousness. And in that moment, the whole world collapses into one singular experience. And that is Vedanta. Vedanta actually means the end of knowing. Now there is nothing more to know. So from Nyaya where you begin your journey of knowledge and to Vedanta where you end by merging into that, you know, unified field of consciousness. This is how Ayurveda describes the mind. So what, what we can tell is that learning what is mind in Ayurveda is itself an experience. Don't expect to take away a definition from Ayurveda because each one of us can take a different definition and say that Ayurveda, many Westerners have said Ayurveda is contradictory and it is just a collection of thoughts because in one place Ayurveda has one take on the mind and in another place it's something else. So a Western critic looks at Ayurveda and says this is a, a text of mutually contradictory statements which can only happen if it was a random collection of thoughts. But they miss the point that this is not a ra randomness or accidental inclusion of ideas, but a process to facilitate your own self-evolution. So if you want to uh, learn what is mind through Ayurveda, what you ultimately end up is be ready for a self-transformation. Because if you are really serious about it, what Ayurveda can do is to help you connect at the level of your own experience of what the mind is and then take you from there to the end of that transformation where you meet your own consciousness, your own inner awareness.